What's going on, everybody? My name is Phil Wright, and you are listening to Phil Wright and Friends, where we have positive conversations about life. Today is a very, very, very special episode. Um, it's very, it's funny that I it, that it's called Phil Wright and Friends because I've I've had the pleasure of having some of my amazing friends, and and the, our guest today, man, we've known each other over ten years now. Um, met him in in college. He was a football player. He would uh you know play. He was a fellow musician and just always a happy guy. Very um very just how can I I can't even put it into words just just always positive he was I I never met somebody that was happy all the time and you know my I was going through stuff back there so my stuff be up and down but this guy here he's always happy always and I noticed he started doing um poetry and uh he played for them amazing Clemson Tigers as well and uh he's here with us today let me just say um Dante Stewart we call him Stu though Stu how's it going man what's up fam i'm good i'm good i'm good how you doing man man i'm trying to keep my shoes tied brother hey ain't we all dog I'm ain't, ain't we all them, bro i'm trying to keep them tied and uh but hey you know i'm just honored man thank you so much for taking time out of um out of your busy schedule to talk with me um he has an amazing book his book is amazing what's tell him the title of your of your of your new book yeah, yeah, yeah. So the book is entitled Shouting in the Fire, an American op- American Epistle. And it is, in some sense, a I love the way somebody described it in, in, in one of the reviews. Um, it is a almost a, a, a letter or story of self-love and, and, and self self-acceptance right. um, in, in many ways that we kind of give our value and our worth to other people and, and the ways in which like they don't do always the right thing with it. So it is, it is that love letter to us black people and it's about us and it's for us and it's to us. Uh, but more than that, it is indeed a love letter to myself. Yeah. I mean, I was sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, like we just spoke, uh, it was very relatable, man. I, I know Stu and I know a lot about Stu, but I learned even more about him. And I also learned the things that we had in common as well. And, um, you know, very touching book, a couple moments I found myself, wiping tears man and Mm. for multiple reasons not only is it just a good book i'm excited just to see the the evolution just like the growth and Mm -hmm. um you know how you evolved as a person and as a writer i remember you doing poetry Mm -hmm. and everything like that and we're going to get into the book but let's start at the beginning for those for those who may not know um dante stewart tell us who is dante stewart yeah bro uh well right now um, you know, I do this thing every morning, bro, uh, where like I write down who I want to become. Uh, and I say, you know, what is the person that I want to become today going to accomplish today? Um, and I'm, I want to be somebody that's healthy and fit. I want, I'm a husband and father. I'm a writer. I'm a pastor, leader, student, scholar. So that's, that's mainly who I am, bro. And it's really, for me, it's like, I'm, I'm somebody who's, you know, to try and, trying to get better trying to grow up trying to mature trying to learn trying to give myself and others something you know that's valuable and meaningful in in any given day um i'm trying to be a better person who learned how to rest you know so so that's 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 kind of why i'm yeah that's why i'm struggling at right now and it's like really like really like resting a little bit and 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 kind of peeling back and 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 getting away and trying to find a new rhythm in life but yeah that's who i am bro immediately right now and i'm working on my thesis uh for school so i am definitely in that student scholar mode and oh and right, yeah yeah I'm yeah i can right now so, so most people who who would see you they would say man he's a husband like you said you're a scholar you write books mm-hmm. and 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 um you know just a great guy but you definitely had to beat some odds. Um, I believe yeah. you, coming to Clemson, you came as a walk-on originally, yeah, right? And, um, yep. you know, I, I, I want to talk about your journey there. Um, one one of our themes here is sticking to the plan and not wasting any time. So, you mm. know, as far as sticking to the plan and that journey to Clemson and to play on a collegiate level, like that's, I mean, it's a low percentage of high school players that make it mm-hmm. to the college level as well as a D one school and a top ranked mm-hmm. school as, as well. So talk to us a little bit about your journey 
to uh, Clemson University? Yeah, so I was raised, in, in, in as many of us are, in, in the Black Rural South. Uh, I'm from St. Matthew, so between St. Matthew, South Carolina, Swansea, South Carolina, and uh, Santa Ron, South Carolina. And so much of my childhood was in between the church, the school, and the field or the track. Uh, so I played, I played football and I ran track. I was terrible at basketball. So I, I got cut from basketball twice and that just killed my basketball dreams. You know, I was, I was that dude that was just like way too fast to dribble. Um, so I, my, my dribble stunk. Stu, I, I made fast. it to the I last play. cut, man. Believe it or not. But I made it to the last cut. Yeah. I, I think I, I made it to it. the last cut and, and, and twice, but then I, I just couldn't make it over the hump, bro. Hey, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I could, I couldn't make it over the hump. It, it just was terrible. And so I'll never forget, bro, like playing football in ninth grade where I was actually playing varsity, um, in, in the ninth grade. Um, and, and playing varsity in the ninth grade, I, um, I love like Reggie Bush during this moment. Uh, and I, and I was like so many young dudes who wore the white socks with the black, sh- uh, cleats and the white strings. And I played like one play you know, and, and that whole season. And then I, I don't know, something just clicked in the off season where I was just like, yo, when I come back from my 10th grade year, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to be that dude. I'm going to be a dog. And so I worked very, very hard to be that person. And, you know, first kickoff of, of, of my 10th grade year, I took that joint back 95 yards and that was, that was all she wrote. And, and so much of my upbringing was, yeah, it was about football and training in the summer, trying to get better, but then also, you know, playing drums in church and, 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 and things like that. And then, you know, once I, once I got time to, to kind of decide to where I was going to go for college, you know, I got offered by a D1 AA school, but during that moment, I was young. I was like, yo, I ain't playing D1 AA. I'm going D1, baby. I was like, yo, I'm going D1. So, but then there, there, there's, and in some sense, like, you know, when it came, I, I told my mom, I was like, yo, I don't want to go out of state, but I'm going to go to, so I'm going to just go to Clemson because, you know, South Carolina, they, they were saying there's going to offer, but then they reneged on that. And so I was just like, you know what? I, I'm, I, what about Clemson? So then I was like, yeah, I'm going to Clemson. So we did everything. We applied. I got my acceptance letter and I made that decision. I was like, nah, I'm not going to D1 AA, but I'm going to play. I'm going to play uh, at Clemson and I'm going, I'm not just going to go show up. I'm not happy to be on the team and just have a Jersey. I'm going to actually go play. And when I think about it right now, bro, (laughs) that is so audacious. Yeah. And I think, and I think, and I think for me, that audacity still lingers. Like one of one of my friends, we was doing a book event together, and he asked me at the end of the event, he was like, "Yo, what would t- you tell ten year old Dante? Like looking back now, what would you tell ten year old Dante?" And I told him, I was like, "Yo, I would tell him that I, yo, I'm so proud of the ways in which you never stopped showing up for yourself. And when I look at every moment of transition in my life, I'll be at terrible moments, or be at great moments." Right. I never stopped showing up for myself, even right now in this moment, bro, where I'm trying to work on this thesis. I'm trying to work on book number two. I'm doing ministry stuff. I'm trying to take care of my body. I'm trying to take care of my family. I mean, it gets very hard. It's challenging. It's exhausting. But I never lost that audacity to where I believe continually in myself and believe that, yo, if I'm going to show up, I'm coming here to win. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to do the best I can right. and I'm going to have fun doing it. But I actually came, I live for the stage. And so, yeah, bro. Yeah. That's, that's an amazing. You have an amazing story coming to Clemson and, you know, most people would say, all right, you come to Clemson, you get accepted and you're on the team. Now <laughs> you got it made. Now that's it. That, mm-hmm. I mean, it's smooth selling. Now once you, um, the transition from, from high school to getting there and it seems like okay i'm here now i guess i can throw my feet up now so tell was it that easy no uh not at <laughs> all bro that? yeah yeah no nah, <laughs> yeah, no nah, nah, nah. it was a process bro you go through you go through a moment where like you know when when you think about audacity bro you also think about risk and the possibility of failure right and when you think about the possibility of failure sometimes you actually do fail um fast forwarding I actually end up leaving Clemson at the height of my career. 
I end up leaving Clemson. Yes, I came back and finished my degree, but at the height of my career, literally, like I leave. And there was a that was a moment where failure got the best of me. But then like it's like, you know, that that's a part of it. It's not easy to kind of do what we imagine in our heads and like what we actually experiencing right now in our present realities. It's not always easy. And there are going to be moments where we're smacked into the face without limitation. But that's the thing about it. It's like, yes, embrace your limitation, but also keep garnering faith in yourself and what you can do because yeah, it ain't easy. And it wasn't easy working out, showing up again and again, like, getting beat again and again, getting burned in practice again and again, and, and showing back up to the line and being like, yo, let's go again. like you got me one time. Let's go. You got me twice. Let's go. You got me three times. Let's go. You got me four times. Let's go. Like I might not beat you on number one, but I will outwork you. And at some point I might beat you at number 10. And then guess what we're going to do? We're going to talk trash. We're going to yes. celebrate. And we still going to walk off the field and be homies and you're going to be my dog. And I think that's one of the challenges about kind of life in general, especially when things get hard. It's like, yo, when we get to those moments of hardness, we kind of either want to shut down um, or, or, or become bitter. But I think, and in some sense, like we, we, we kind of like try to finesse one another. Right to where you you know we do things that's like where we're skeptical of one another, right. but then there's something to be said about the ways in which like we press and do and press through hard things together, like in a mutual energy, right. and how like we need a team in order to like either boost us up to say like yo you can do it, or to be like hey fam like like you know all right what you're doing right now is like not cool. You're not going the right way. Take this way, or you might you're doing this wrong maneuver. Go this way, and right. things like that. So it's not hard, but you do get better over time. So this power and collaboration and community is that something Facts. I'm kind of taking from what you said. I heard a um, I heard a message the other day, and they you know, they were talking about Paul and Silas. They talk about the partner and Paul uh, of of partnerships. And they said, mm-hmm. you don't, re- when you read that, pe- that particular passage of scripture, it's not just saying Paul began to cry. I said, Paul and Silas. So, you mm-hmm. know, he might not have had mm-hmm. the same result if had it just been him. So from the, I just, that's what, that's something that I took from what you said. It's like this power and community and everything mm-hmm. like that. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's an amazing story. Even before we get into the book, book the book round, uh, realm of uh, the interview, um, let's talk about, you know, even playing at Clemson, you being a D1. I'm going to tell you when I knew when I knew that you were going to make it. I don't know if you remember this. Your I last, probably don't, bro. You're going to have to you're going to have to remind me. I probably your don't. Your last week, your last week in Clemson, you pulled me and, you know, our home uh, Al and Devin and some of us to the side and you say, "Hey man, I'm about to transition. I'm about to do this this this. I want to sow a seed in y'all's life." You gave us all $20. Do you remember that? Nah, bro, I did. <laughs> yeah. He said, look, Dang. man, I'm gonna hang in there, man. This is just a stepping stone for what's coming to coming ahead. And I know that God is gonna do this. You know, you know, you was just encouraging us. You said, I'm stepping out on faith, and you gave us you just handed us all twenty dollars. I said, you're still giving me twenty dollars for us. This is crazy. Dang. But yeah, man, Dang. right then I knew that there was something different wow. about you. I knew that wow. um I knew that you were destined to win. Because, um, wow. you know, it, it, it goes to say using what you got and, uh, you know, just using what you got and everything like that, man. So, you know, I Bro. that day I, I said to myself, I said, Stu is is going to, you know, he's definitely uh, he's going places because you took a step of faith. No, you know things bro, like- that's real, bro. And, and, and there there I think there there are times where like. I mean, so much of life. Ha- I'm glad you reminded me of that, bro. Like, that's that's beautiful. Thank you, bro. I, I don't even remember that. And, like, so much of life has happened that, like, I want to go back and remember these moments. Yeah. Where, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, these moments of friendship and just, like, stuff like that, bro. Like, I, <laughs> I gave $20 in faith, bro. And it's <laughs> yeah. just, like, 
It's, it's all crazy. Of us were broke. I mean, all of us were broke during that time. I said, man, this dude give me $20. That's crazy, bro. Yeah. Like, that's crazy, dog. But then, like, I think, I think, like, like, that's a part of it, bro. It's like, it's like, bro, like, 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 we need those moments where we remember those stories and trade those stories to, rem- to, to remind of, like, yo, like, there were moments, like, yeah, though, you might have thought that was small. But but that was like a belief. It was big. As much as it was, yeah. I didn't, I didn't think it was yeah. small. I didn't think it was small. No, I, I, I'm speaking in generalities. Like yeah, you yeah. as Dante, you might have think that was yeah. small, but like that that is gigantic. Like that is gigantic. That is something that like that's not just simply like something about what you do. That's something about who you are. And even because even in those moments, bro, like I was dealing with hella insecurity. Yeah. Like I didn't know who I was. Right. Like I, I struggled here. like to 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 define myself or redefine myself. I mean, even even as we think about the book, I mean 2014 when I left and went to Cali with Jazz, you know, got married, like in in 20 all the way up until like 2017, I was like kind of sold and drunk on whiteness and white folk and things like that. And so, you know, even that small thing. It, that that person that I was back then is so different from the person I am right now, but like that person was a person who legit literally believed in themselves, yeah. like no matter what. And and I need to I need to acknowledge that and honor that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm telling you, Sue, like it's it's just no secret that you're one of the top authors in the in the world right now, and oh, I'm not man. just saying that in that, faith. Bro. I'm not just saying that in faith. I'm saying like the way that you put these words together and you were able to um, express yourself, I mean, and, and be vulnerable and, mm-hmm. and to put yourself out there. You know, typically when people write books, you know, they want to say um, <laughs> they want to say, oh, yeah, like they want to make it look like everything's just peachy and everything like yeah, that. Nah. But the thing that I admire and this is why I really believe that whatever the, the desires of your heart is, God is really going to double quadruple. And I don't know what the one word is for 10, <laughs> whatever your the heart's desire is, it's because yeah. you were able to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and just say, this right here is where I was. This right here is where I'm going. It really showed that um, mm. it really showed growth, man. Mm. And, um, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this. So I, I want to talk about the book, the journey to the mm-hmm. book. And, um, you know, we are from the South. We're in South Carolina. I seen a post the other day that said uh, South was Texas, Texas, mm. Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, Georgia. But our, we're South Carolina is very much <laughs> the mm-hmm. South. And um, I'm just hearing a lot of your stories um, about racism and growing up in areas where it was predominantly white or being, you know, looked at sideways and everything. You know, what was that defining moment in your life where you said, I'm going, I got to write this book. I got to get this out of me. Mm. It may, it's hard because like, I think, I think because especially since 2019, I've always just been writing. Um, I've always been writing just, I mean, I'm reading so much. Like you see, like my whole, I mean, my background is like full of books and like, I'm always reading, always writing, trying to like discover like new moments like even right now like i'm working on i'm working on a chapter in my next book um conceptualizing a chapter about the uh, 1969 black student uh, uh student lead for black identity at clemson mm-hmm. where they had a walkout and i don't even know if people know that history that there were like so many students um at clemson that did a sit-in mm-hmm. you know years before the sit-in at sykes um and, and, and things like that so like i've always been like trying to discover these moments these people these places and things so there's always been a part of my thing but then like maybe in 2020 where i was just like you know 2020 was really where i was like yo i gotta write this story for me because i was doing like threads on like my my, my story about being in white evangelicalism and being in white spaces i was like like posting about it i was being in conversation with people about it but i didn't necessarily like chronicle that story um partly because of fear you know when you start talking about being vulnerable and being honest like there are there there are multiple roadblocks in your own life and story 
where where fear can kind of get the best of us, particularly not necessarily like the fear of like, yo, I don't know if I can do this, though that is part of the fear. It's also the fear of, you know, am I courageous enough to tell the story and tell it, it tell the truth, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and I think in 2020, I wrote a I wrote an article that was entitled "Black Rage in an Anti-Black World is a Spiritual Virtue" for Sojourners Magazine, and I mean the article took off. But then also what what happened was in that article I talked a lot about what happened and what I became. Um, um, that also the Washington Post article about my time in white evangelicalism um, happened as well. And then I think I think it was it was those moments when when those articles came out. I was like, yo. Like I really got to press and probe into the story and, and try and figure out, get to the bottom of it, of myself, or, or at least begin to get the bottom, get to the bottom of like who I was and I became. And then, you know, over time, as I started to just show up and write, yeah, fumble my way through it, the book it itself. came to be, bro. It, it just came like it, like, that's the thing I'm dealing with right now with book number two is like, you know, I'm kind of fumbling and stumbling my way forward in in it. You know, it's just like music. Right. It's like music. Yeah. It's like you know, you gotta have sound check. You, yeah. you you gotta you gotta you gotta have sound check. And like sound check is a part of like it legitimately is a part of like you playing that night, like or that day, that morning. It's like we kind of getting warmed up. We kind of we kind of getting loose and things like that. You know, we we open it up a bit. So that like when when that moment come in the song or in in service, we're ready for that moment because we already had sound check. And so like for me, those articles and essays, yeah, were a part of me feeling my way through writing the story. And most of all, it was the people around me who believed in me, like to tell me that yo, you can do this. Whether it's my wife, whether it's my friends who were writers. Like these people, they, 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 these, these others, they really like were like my angels. They were my cheerleaders that let me know like, yo, you, you can do this. You can do it. Keep going. You can do it. You can do it. Keep going. Keep going. Keep writing. It's challenging right now, but you can do it. And over time, as I started to get the, as I, as I started to get kind of where I wanted to do, how I wanted to write the story and the freedom to write it like the way I wanted to write it, then, then it just, over time it came, it came. So the, the book is amazing. There are some amazing topics, amazing conversations and um, point of views in it. Uh, for somebody who didn't know, is it, would, would you say, is this book for the African American or is it for white America or is yeah. it for like who, if I'm walking in Barnes and Noble, who could yeah. benefit most from this book? I think, I think so on, on the one hand, it's, it's, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a book that people can make it whatever they want to make it. I think there's room for me as I went into my writing process, as a, I was writing it for us. I was writing it for those of us who are black and white space, uh, who left home, the kind of black spaces that we grew up in. Uh, who were trying to walk out the attention of like being black in this white America, but then also being black in black churches where like oftentimes the church is not a place that's, you know, that's for us. Right. Um, even though now, you know, I'm still kind of in the black church and, and, and things like that as a minister, but I, I, I wrote it mainly for us, but then I do think people can benefit from it wherever they are at in their journey, whether one really wants to think about, you know, self-love, you can meet me in these places where I'm thinking about self-love. Whether one think, want to think about white supremacy and racism, you can meet me there. Whether one, you know, wants to think about like, like whether one wants to think about, um, let's see, whether one wants to think about like grandparents and what does it mean to go back home or what does it mean to live in a moment of suffocation, particularly like 2020, right. or even, you know, what does it mean to like, you know, be in love and to love and to find love and to search for love. Right. You know, I think that those are all touch points and connection points in the book that people can, can, can generate. Um, so yes, as a writer, I was writing for us, but then I think, you know, I think whoever wants to get it and read it, there's something in there for everybody. Great. Um, 
Let, let's talk a little bit about racism and church. Um, we're in a weird place as far as racism and church and even um, predominantly white churches that yeah, are facts. open to African-Americans. Maybe you experienced it or, you know, what, so what, what, what's your take on racism in church, like the current state? Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's, if we think about white churches and, and, and black churches, I think for white churches, 2000, I think 2020 opened a lot up for, for in general. Uh, regarding race and church, but this goes all the way back to Trayvon Martin. Um, when Trayvon Martin happened, I mean, in 2012, you know, at least since 2012, and it's been beyond before 2012, you know, you can go to the 2000s or, you know, the late 90s, the early 90s, the 80s, the 70s. I mean, at every moment, there were experiences of black people experience in, in public or in private experiencing the terror of white supremacy through the form of policies, through the form of policing or through the form of vigilante violence. Um, and whether you're talking about George Zimmerman, neighborhood, the neighborhood cop uh, following and murdering Trayvon Martin, whether you're talking about, you know, all the way to George Floyd or Sandra Bland, um, or Breonna Taylor or, or Tatiana Jefferson. There have always been these moments, you know, that that in in religious spaces, there's always been this kind of moment of reckoning uh, again and again and again, uh, particularly from the perspective of white people. Um, but I think the state right now is in 2020, a lot of people did a lot of things that they weren't necessarily prepared for to actually, to not just simply like actually like, to, to change it and to deal with it, but actually to sustain whatever change could be possible. So you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of white churches, you know, hire black staff and say, you know, this is going to be diversity. Check it you off know, the list. And, yeah, like yeah check it off the list. It's like status quo, uh, just, or meeting a quote or whatever, uh, checking it off the list or they say, okay, we're going to read these books, you know, and things like that. Or, you know, we're going to invite these people to preach in the pulpit. You know, but they didn't change the fundamental structure of their church and what their church actually, you know, desires or who they desire or what they don't desire. Um, and I think right now, from the perspective of black churches, we're in a moment where, like, you know, a lot of us black people, uh, at least since the 1980s, uh, have been in white evangelical spaces, have been in white Christian spaces. And this happened particularly in the 1980s. Um, and, 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 and have given power to whiteness and, and then came back to black church spaces with the kind of feel of black church. So we can hoot, we can praise, break, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we have the thought and the theology of white Christianity that blames black people that, that, that has this idea of, you know, you, you know, what matters most is like your, your soul and your spirit rather than what happens in the country and in your body. And so I think the state of like race and racism in the church is like an every evolving thing where we, we continually need to think about how our theology and our practice either upholds and protects racism and white supremacy the anti-blackness or it dismantles it and gives us a better story to, to, to be invested in and to live out. Okay, man, that's an amazing answer. Um, in the book, you were talking about how you started attending a, a predominantly white church. And, um, um, what do you think was the reason for kind of stepping away from the black church we know it and, and being more attracted to what attracted you to the predominantly white church i think it was just the difference but then also acceptance um so it was just a different experience um right. it was different religious experience and, and you know i was young you know i just want to try something different something right new. right yeah you know i was tired of wearing suits to church and, and things <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that so you know, tired of being in church all day. And so Amen. That, that probably, yeah, that, prob <laughs> that probably was a part of it. It's just like, you know, yeah, it was a part of it. But then I think about it. Ain't no white churches ever had no canteen like Judah. Like they never handed students grocery bags, bro. To, yeah. to like every week, week in and week out. And the right. students grow. Never have I experienced that at a white church ever in my life. And when I tried to do it, they shut it down. There's like, nah. Like when I tried to do it at my white church, they was like, no. 
I actually launched that particular um that particular ministry like with the um college Dang, ministry wow. and um the the heart behind it was I actually was listening to Stephen Furtick one day and he said he was talking about something he was doing he was in the middle of his sermon he said who would have ever thought that nutty buddies and and snow cones would have got a whole dorm room saved and mm-hmm. And when I heard that, it just kind of, I'm futuristic, you know, you know, the, the mm-hmm. five course strengths, futuristic relator and all that type of stuff. And that college ministry kind of started because I felt like the system was, was set up to help people, not all people was set up to help some folks who didn't want to do anything, but we just gave them a bunch of handouts, but there were college students mm-hmm. that were starving. When I, um, my freshman year of college, you know, I mean, I was blessed to have food and groceries and stuff like that. And I was start, I was trying to figure out why everybody always wanted to come, come to my house and eat. Like when I, when I was mm-hmm. out in Atlanta and everything, but I realized there's a lot of students didn't have food. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? A lot of students mm-hmm. didn't have, you know, some people, they, they can't afford to send their kids with resources and some just don't. So, you know, what? Mm-hmm. nothing against feeding the less fortunate but let's not neglect the students because you know at least mm-hmm. they're working towards something and i just felt like mm-hmm. it was important for us to really give them something there um mm-hmm. so you know that's kind of the heart behind that man that's lit bro i didn't yeah. even know that bro that that's amazing bro like thank you for that because that 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 blessed me tremendously well see i like, didn't have enough i didn't have us. the yeah. funds just to bless people like this but you know, um, part of the 16 personalities, mine is campaigner. And you probably know this just from knowing me over the years, I have the ability to round, mm-hmm. rally people together for a particular cause to get something done. So that was just something I always was, I always was good at like far as rallying people mm-hmm. together. And that's the reason why we, mm-hmm. we did that. But yeah, man, that's, that's, wow. that's, that, that's just something that we did during that season. And it's still going, even though I'm not yeah. there, it's still going. Wow. Um, but wow. um, um, also with, with somebody who's worked in the black church and the white church, I feel that the African, the predominantly African American church has a long way to go. And, um, this is coming mm-hmm. from somebody who's worked on both sides. A lot of times you hear people on the that, that are in um, the traditional African American church that dog the white churches, and mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. But they never experienced it. I've, I, I'm not going to say their opinion isn't valid, but I'm saying mm-hmm. until you've been in both, you really can't speak effectively on those mm-hmm. particular topics. So speak mm-hmm. to the black church now, like what can, wh- where, not the dog, not necessarily dogging us, but what can we do to, to turn mm-hmm. it up a notch or get better? Mm. I mean, we gotta, I feel like we just always gotta be about creating space. Like, like we have to be about like, yeah, we have to be about creating space for, 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 for others. Uh, particularly those who are marginalized in black black church spaces, particularly black women and those who are black LGBTQ. Uh, we, we can't say that like we love ourselves and love one another. And then, you know, we do, we, we, we have these campaigns, you know, when like black men die. So we have these, these campaigns, like when black men die in public, it's like, yo, like let's do something about the system. But then when black women die or when black LGBTQ die or be oppressed or be harmed, it's like, oh, well, we, we kind of, well, nah, you know, that's, that, that issue is just too touchy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, we need to do a better job at that. I mean, we need to be the type of people who, who are not just concerned, you know, about the programmatic things of church, but like legit, like, you know, let's, let's all figure out how we can heal. You know, we got a lot of trauma that we hold in that we need to heal, uh, that we need to be on a collective journey of like, you know, healing and things like that. But then also I think we as black churches need to be open to like, and this is also a part of creating space that we got to be open to change. Um, we, we, we're in a new moment um, in church in general, post pandemic church is just different. And we all trying to figure out, you know, how to do post pandemic church. But I think also, we're in a different moment as it relates to religion and spirituality for young people mm-hmm. um, and those young people. And we as young people have to lead the way in that and have to figure out how to do the, that type of work and lead that way um, um, together in, in partnership with churches. Um, and that means that some people, you know, you, you have to realize, you know, when the difference between being emergent and then being emeritus 
You know, okay. I think I think I, I I don't think many leaders kind of get that tension of like, yo, at one point you were an emergent pastor, you were an emergent leader, you were an emergent preacher. You know, now, you know, you're emeritus. And and that doesn't mean that you lose any of your influence or lose any of your flavor, but that means that you create space for other generations to come up and to 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 inherit something that we believe that is beautiful in uh, that is called, you know, the black church. Um, and I think that's where so many of us are struggling uh, continually. But then also, I think, you know, we have to celebrate who we actually are. Yeah. Like, 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 like we go to church, we do church. But like, we got to know our history, too. Yeah, and we got to know where all this comes from and, and to hold on to the power of what the black church is or black Christianity, black faith is and what it can become. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. Um uh as a as a author, as as you transitioned out of the, the church you were at um before, um did you get any backlash from the book or did anybody reach out to you or say, Yeah, I read your book and I don't agree or you know, did you get any any kickback from your book? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you don't write anything that honest and 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 don't get any type of you know pushback. Yeah, I've mm-hmm. I've gotten a lot of pushback in so many areas, but you know, for me, bro, that's that's a part of the job, bro. That's what you sign up for, bro. Like, like it, it just is what it is, bro. It's a part of it's a part of the job. You know, you kind of write through it, you work through it, you 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 therapy through it, um, and 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 you just keep it going. You keep doing it. Um, I mean, I've 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 had a moment where like you know like old church members went on this whole diatribe where where one of my friends sent it to me Mm -hmm. uh of like you know that that might not be the best thing to do you know send this to me but it's like (laughs) she was saying like yo you want me to go off on them i'm like hey do your thing do whatever you want to do whatever you see fit Uh, and she and she did she she defended me she she was saying you know do you want me to you know say something and defend you um and she Mm -hmm. felt it best you know to defend me on that on that thread you know, and I mean, I've had those things happen, but like my mind is kind of geared on the work, on the yeah. focus on the work. I'm, I'm right. about the work, the work. You know, I'm about the work. That's that's what my I, I got too much, I got too much in here, bro. To 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 be too distracted. That doesn't mean I don't get distracted at all, but be too distracted about what's happening out there and all the noise. Like even right now, like like I'm in a I'm in a moment where I'm just like I need that mental space to work i need a mental space to think to write right. to be present you know with myself and be present with my family you know if i'm so concerned about what the, somebody else said then you know i can't write you know i can't i can't i can't do the work um yeah yeah so yes yeah, i've had a lot of pushback but you know it, it comes with it right. but you wrote your truth different. that was your truth and nobody can take your truth away from you right. yeah that right. that's really dope um right I definitely uh, appreciate you for coming on, man. And and before we go, I just there there may be someone who is uh, struggling with their faith. Um, there's somebody that's that may not have any sense of faith at all, or they're searching for purpose. I think one thing about the um, pandemic, what it's taught us, it, it's taught us that sometimes the system systems aren't in place to really support us. So we're, that's why so many entrepreneurs are, are raising up during this particular time. Um, what encouragement would you give to that person who is, you know, maybe struggling with their faith and still searching for their purpose as well? And they may be torn or, you know, what, 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 what advice would you give them? I, I mean, if I'm being honest, bro, I would just tell them that that's okay. You know, now that's probably the best thing that you can say because in those moments, you know, you don't need. Sometimes you don't need advice. Sometimes you don't need books to read. Sometimes you just need to tell somebody to tell you that that's okay, and that's normal, and and just say you're going you're going to find your way. You, you you're going to find your way. You know, you keep trusting, keep 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 walking, keep showing up. You know, you're going to change. That's a part of it. That's life. You know, when things happen, we change. You know, we just want to make sure that that change, you know, actually helps us become better and more right. loving and bigger um, and, 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 and more trusting, 
you know, and things like that. So I would tell them, like, it's okay. You're going to change. And that's a part of the process, you know, and that, that, that so many of us go that way. Um, and yeah, yeah, you're going to land on solid ground. Yeah, I wouldn't even give any advice. I would just tell them, like, it's okay. And, and you're going to be okay. Just keep on walking. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with my good friend, my brother, um, Mr. Dante Stewart. Um, I'm a, tr- I'm a proud friend. I'm a proud brother. Yeah, bro. Um, um, this guy is amazing. He's nice. And, and I, I purposely didn't dig too deep in today because he's somebody that I definitely want to continue to have conversations with over the next, uh, next few years, um, on different topics. So you'll be hearing from him a lot on Phil Wright and Friends podcast. Remember, stick to the plan. Um, you mm-hmm. know, don't waste any time. And so, you know, look, it's, it's up from here. It's up from here. We got Dante Stewart. Yeah. Where can they find your book and, and your information? Yeah, where, yeah. Yeah. Wherever books are sold, bro. Um, He's it, everywhere. it should be there. Yeah. It should be <laughs> there. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. hoping. No, no. Uh, I, I mean, not, well, if they're not, wherever if books they are sold. sold out, they may have sold out. Yeah. They may have sold out. And if, and if it's not there, then request it. But then also I would, I would tell people, you know, local libraries too. You know, mm-hmm. to support our local libraries, our local bookstores, request a book, you know, buy the book through your local bookstore, you know, but if you can't, then I mean, it's, it's like Amazon, it's book, bookshop, uh, Barnes and Noble, you know, pretty much anywhere books are sold. You heard it right there, Mr. Dante Stewart, ladies and gentlemen, Phil Wright and Friends podcast, positive conversations about life, man, be inspired to that today. Um, Keep your head up. Keep smiling. Keep, you know, do everything that you're supposed to do. Don't let that idea die. Don't quit. You're almost at the finish line. Don't you dare quit. (laughs) Hang in there. This is Phil Wright and Friends. Before you leave, make sure that you are following us on all of the social media platforms. You can follow this on Instagram at Phil Wright Podcast. My personal page is P. Wright Music. Don't forget that amazing food page I got, Phil Mills. And Cafe Joel Music for all my live music lovers. If you have any questions or show ideas, you can email us at philwrightfriends at gmail.com. Look, I really need you guys to go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and subscribe and like all of our videos <laughs> at uh, Phil Wright TV. We have some amazing um, short clips from some of our interviews. We have some amazing things going on there as well. Thank you guys for tuning in to Phil Wright and Friends podcast where we have positive conversations about life. You guys mean the world to me and I mean that. Y'all have a good one.